This video is going to be focused on explaining what master morality is. In, the, in our reading, Nietzsche distinguishes between two different sort, kinds of moral systems, master morality and slave morality, and we'll look at what master morality is in this video. So, remember that uh, on Nietzsche's view, the good moral systems, what are those? Those are the ones that make life worth living, and Christianity does this, in his view, by providing a long obedience and bondage to uh, an irrational and unnatural system whose tyranny and stupidity educates the spirit, producing the only things that make life worth living, specifically these sort of things that transfigure our life or give us a sort of sense of meaning or purpose or connection or a bigger perspective. So Nietzsche is going to tell us that master morality is what can do that the best, and so we need to understand what master morality is, because that's what he's, in some sense, recommending for us. So well, here are three people who we might think of as um, pursuing master morality. So we have uh, Pancho Villa, who was a very important uh, figure in the Mexican Revolution. Uh, he didn't, in the end, actually succeed in becoming part of the government that uh, came out of the Mexican Revolution, but he was a very important figure and very sort of um, very a very powerful figure and very sort of much sort of hear my ideas and this is what we're going to do very sort of arrogant and had a very very strong personality he was a very successful general uh top uh, then on the on the other on the side on the other side we have that's a picture of Jeff Bezos who is the uh, owner and founder of Amazon so he obviously has had a huge impact in the world by sort of having a vision and realizing it and then we have Miles Davis who uh, is a seminal jazz trumpeter again uh has a, a great sort of artistic vision and expressed it in his music so if you aren't familiar with the album kind of blue uh highly suggest it uh so those are three examples uh bezos uh miles davis and pancho via people who are living out i think nietzsche would think of them as um uh, examples of master morality so master morality, in his view, fundamentally is uh, self-glorification. It's, so it's saying, I am wonderful, and here's my view of sort of how I'm wonderful, and then making that real. So it's seeing yourself as the source of value. When we think of utilitarianism or Kantianism, the source of value is basically other people. I mean, you're valuable as one person among many, but only as one person among many. Whereas if you're following master morality, you see yourself as value as valuable and as a source of value and your judgments as a source of value so you say that's good and that makes it good and Nietzsche thinks that this idea that you're the source of value that this is life enhancing that this leads you to have these um, you know do things like create the Sistine Chapel or lead a you know play a huge role in the Mexican Revolution or create a company like Amazon or something like that it's a, a certain form of sort of human excellence of humanity uh, exerting itself on the world, including on other people. And so you're making the world, in a sense, in your image. And so it's not just about pleasure. It's about creation and power. And it's about creation and power in a way that isn't, that is, um, sort of is, provides this really big perspective. So Nietzsche talks about what he calls plenitude and power and high tension and wealth. And a big part of this for him is that you're hard on yourself. So there's a, what he talks about rigorous self-discipline. And this could be provided, as in Michelangelo's case, by the church through Christianity or some other set of religious beliefs or some other set of non-religious beliefs. So what we have is you're imposing your own view on the world in some act of creation that transforms your worldview, other people's worldview, and is accomplished in part through harsh self-discipline. So how does this sort of master moralist who sees themselves in, in, in all this as a wonderful source of value relate to other people? Well, there are other powerful people, and those are going to be friends and rivals of the person following powerful person following master morality. Not necessarily sympathy or impartiality. These are rivals and friends. Um, so they're friends, you're partial towards them, they're rivals, you want to defeat them. What about towards the less powerful? Well, uh, you would look down on the less powerful. Why? Well, because they're not these sort of sources of creative value. And you're going to think of them as bad and inferior. You're going to reject them. You don't necessarily bully them. You don't need to. Why would you? You're better than them. You don't need to. Uh, but you certainly don't treat them as your equal. 
You may help the less powerful, but you're not required to. As a master moralist, you're expressing your own value, and that may, you know, involve assistance to other people. It may benefit other people, right? So you could think, certainly we benefit from, you know, Miles Davis's music and the Sistine Chapel. In many ways, we benefit from Amazon, although in other ways, maybe we're harmed by Amazon. Um, was the, you know, what do we think about the Mexican Revolution? That's a complicated question. Indeed, it would seem that it would be okay to harm others if doing so helps your self-expression, right? You're a source of value, you're engaged if you're following master morality and succeeding in this sort of, you know, expression of value and creation of value. Well, okay, if, you know, harming others or not treating them well is a part of your self-expression, well, it's the self-expression that's the value, so it's not clear why you, if you're following master morality, it looks like there's no reason why you are required to not harm others. Now, not everyone who is selfish is necessarily following master morality. Master morality is not any old selfishness. It's not uh, just because you're powerful doesn't mean you follow it, um, and simply sort of pursuing pleasure doesn't mean you follow it. And so I do not, for example, think of our current president as a pursuer of master morality. Why not? Well, because the master moralist has a sort of, on Nietzsche's view, has a very sort of strong, secure sense of his or her own worth and value and does not need that sense of value is not easily threatened and does not need to uh, put others down just in order to feel valuable. I would suggest that we don't see our president exhibiting those values and so if I'm right about that then he is not a, a proponent of master morality. Now maybe you disagree with me about the president, that's fine, uh, but if you think of if you think of Trump as, for example, sort of vain but also insecure, then you would not think of him as pursuing master morality. So Nietzsche's view is master morality, that's the best way to live a life worth living. That's what makes one's own life most worth living. Even though uh, it, you know, you're treating yourself as, uh, when you're doing it, is superior to many others and thereby... Uh, able to not necessarily treat them very well, and in that way, very much a contrast with utilitarianism and Kantianism.